show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's November the 16th, 2023. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Canesport.com. Joined this morning by our managing editor, Matt Shodell, as we discuss the news of the day presented today by Caneswear, your headquarters for all your Miami Hurricanes merchandise needs. Uh, it's getting near the end of the season. Yeah, holiday season coming up. If you haven't been to Canesware yet this season, now is your time. On your way to or from the Louisville game on Saturday, you can go by Canesware at their location at 2655 South University Drive in Davie. Uh, pick up some stuff. Um, you can even pick up a sub at La Spada's next door, best subs in South Florida. And um, make sure you load up on your stuff at Canesware. They've got a wide assortment of hurricane needs. The largest hurricane store ever created. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Canesware later in the show. Uh, but, Matt, I wanted to start out today. Uh, I decided to write a column because, you know, I'm sitting at Mario Cristobal's post-game presser. Uh, the other day in uh, in Tallahassee. And Mario says that nobody wants to talk about where the program was when he, when he got to Miami. And I didn't totally agree with him. You know, I think we've talked about it a lot. Uh, I, I think we're almost two years in. I'm about to – this is going to be it. I did it in a column for today. And this is – going to be my self-imposed end of talking about the past. Not going to talk about Manny Diaz. Not going to talk about what the program was run like the last 20 years. We are going to look forward from here and stop looking back. But I thought about it. Like, why would Mario want to want, want the focus on that after the Florida State game? And I, I started looking at it. And I've, I've been pretty clear that I think the program's made a ton of progress in the uh, almost two years now that Mario has been head coach, certainly from last year to this year, enormous progress. You look up and down the program, the offensive line is miles better. The running back position has been better this year. The defense has been playing lights out under Lance Gidry, who's definitely a keeper's defensive coordinator. I can't imagine that he would leave for another program after one year here, accomplishing as much as he has. I know people are worried about him going to LSU or USC. Um, man, that would be just majorly disappointing because, you know, Mario Cristobal, who has struggled to hit on his coaching hires, has hit on Lance Gidry for sure. I think, you you know, you'll, I'm sure you'll comment on that in a minute and probably – for a rare moment, agree with me. Um, but then I started looking at the, I mean, I see this improvement everywhere. I mean, even the, the cornerbacks that had never played, you know, Jadeus Richard, uh, Damari Brown, who were playing in the game the other day, held up great against Florida State's great receivers. I mean, we're seeing player development. We're seeing improvement. Uh, special teams, for the most part, have been pretty good. I mean, we're seeing it across almost across the board on this team, other than at quarterback, which you know we, we've we've beaten it to death. I mean, Tyler Van Dyke, Shannon Dawson, I think there's shared blame. A lot of people just want to blame everything on Tyler, um, but Matt, they have so little to show for all of this improvement. I mean, they've lost four of the last six games, all in the ACC. The two games they've won were in overtime. As we sit here today, going into a game against the number nine team in the country on Saturday, they're in 10th place in the ACC, unfathomable. So we think there's all this improvement, and I, I would absolutely argue with anybody to the, to, to the end. Like, we can have a draw, an old-school draw, if somebody wants to disagree with this. I'm sure somebody will in the YouTube comments. But uh, – Miami is a vastly improved football program with very little to show for it, Matt. So I wrote a column about that this morning. It's on the website. Everybody can check it out. Uh, but your thoughts? Well, there's 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 some some stuff I agree with you about, and some that I probably delve a little deeper into. For instance, if Miami played Middle Tennessee this year and lost by one point, would that be improvement? No, you know. So there's levels. Of improvement, and I think where fans are getting hung up is that there's not enough improvement. I think they expected improvement. How could they not? 
I mean, the team was awful last year. Of course there's improvement. If there wasn't improvement this year, it would be a total embarrassment. Uh, but, but you know, with that, with that said, it, I, I've said it for a long time now, uh, over a year, what Mario Cristobal said after the game at Florida State is what I kept saying he should have said when he took the job or even before this season uh, or before last season. He refused to say it. I don't understand why until all of a sudden now when he realizes, uh-oh, you know, things haven't gone real well. We've, you know, we've, we're two and four, those two, the last six games, both of those wins were in overtime that could have gone either way because that's what overtime wins are. And now all of a sudden he feels this need to point out to everybody, hey, you guys aren't writing about it, but look what I got when I took over. That's literally what he said. And I just wish he had told people up front, you know, my big thing with Mario is he always talks about what's real. We wanted, we, we want to hit it head on. We want to talk about what's real. Uh, the whole mantra, the whole mindset of the program, but he never keeps it real with the outside, only with the inside. And that does a disservice for the people that are spending their hard earned money to go to these games, to to buy a $10 beer that they can then throw at Tyler Van Dyke uh, after the game is over. Because at the end of the day, Mario doesn't really grasp the full picture. He only grasps that he wants his team to be really good. He's not understanding that outside expectations are important to manage with your fan base in the NIL era. It maybe didn't matter at FIU. Maybe it didn't matter at Oregon before the NIL era. But in the NIL era, you need your fans to give money to the collective. And if you do not placate your fans and let them know exactly what's going on in your program, why will they help you? When you say, oh, this guy's healthy, that guy's healthy, and then they're out the whole year. You know, Elijah Arroyo in week three, he's coming back this week. We haven't seen Elijah Arroyo. Um, he won't talk about quarterback starters. He will not even give fans an, an inkling of what's going on with the team. He won't let reporters into practice or even on campus anymore, except for a, a short press conference on Mondays. Now, I would argue that really doesn't let fans see what the program's all about. I would argue that their new thing, you know, it's not that new, but over the last four or five years where you can't even do a one-on-one -on -one interview anymore with a player to do a really nice in-depth feature. And these are not, we're not hard-hitting journal hitting journalists trying to, you know, blow up a 20-year-old's a, a life with a story. We're trying to write about, write about you know, really interesting stories. And I, and, and, you know, maybe some things they've overcome in their lives to get to where they are. Maybe they didn't start out their, their careers really well. Well, here's why, and here's how I got better. You know, here's my message to recruits that want to come to Miami. There are so many different things that you can talk to players about one-on-one -on -one where they really open up to you versus these ridiculous Zoom calls, you know, <laughs> where most of the time they just have no interest in even being on the calls. Uh, you know, because I'm, look, I'm, I'm friendly with a bunch of the players just from, when they were recruits and per UM rules, I can't even text these players. I can't call these players. I'm not allowed to, you know, if I run into Cam Kinchins in the Grove, I talk to him. I run into various players around whatever I talk to them, but I don't ask about the team. You know, they're always assuming at UM, they're always assuming like there was one, one story I like to tell where it was a recruiting, big recruiting weekend, maybe three years ago. And I live in the Grove and I walk to Starbucks every morning. If you guys want to stalk me, you can. And I was, uh, I, the way I walk, I walk down Gifford to Starbucks and the way back, I walk past Green Street. And Miami uh, will sometimes have their recruits at Green Street Cafe for breakfast. And I walk by, I don't even look at Green Street, I just walk by at Green Street. And all of a sudden my phone lights up with a text from George Baez, why are you stalking the recruits? And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, he's like, I saw you, I saw you at Green Street. I'm like, dude, like, I walk that way every day, Monday through Sunday. Like, you'll, if you just want to stalk me, you'll see this is nothing abnormal. I didn't even know you guys were there, you know? But, like, this is the sort of attitude, and it's not George's fault. I'm friendly with George. It's not George's fault, but they have this um, edge to them now, and partially because of Mario. Mario is not a fan of any information getting out of anything at all being out there. Uh, even our reporting on Emory Williams with his surgery was just perfectly nice just to let fans know hey he's doing fine he's haven't had the surgery on monday whatever like god forbid he's you know mars asked about a report which was our report he's asked at the press conference can you comment on the report that you know emory is having surgery on monday afternoon and mario refused to even say he was doing okay you know <laughs> um so it's just nice and i'm sure emory would want fans to know like hey i'm doing okay i really appreciate all the support thank you so much but god forbid they ask him for permission to do that uh 
And, and then, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, I don't want to go on too, too long, but you mentioned Shannon Dawson and, and, uh, and, and this has nothing to do with what you're talking about, but like, you know, I started looking up some, some of the past stuff about Shannon Dawson and it was buried in the archives of, of the internet. But I found some really interesting things because I remember we spoke on this show about when Shannon Dawson said very plainly to us, and we both were really impressed that he said it. He said, everywhere I've ever coached as a coordinator, uh, I've always had a really good passing game. I've never had a struggle with the, with the run game. So this is, this is the opposite. And I found that exact same quote that he said at Kentucky when he was there, the exact same quote. And I actually posted on the message board because I couldn't believe it. I said, this is eerie. It was the exact same quote. Troublemaker. Yeah, You're the a exact, troublemaker. <laughs> the exact same problem seven years ago. The exact same problem seven years ago at Kentucky. And they had the exact same quote. And then I found out last year, you know, I don't know why we didn't see this before because we just look, as reporters, we're very shallow people. So we just look at the stats. So when they hired when, <laughs> when Mario hired him from Houston, we look at the stats. Oh, Toon had this amazing year. The offense averaged this many points and this many. It was fantastic. And then I found a story that I think it was late October of last year. The Houston fans were so upset with the offense. They were throwing stuff, booing. And, you know, I don't know if they relieved Shannon of his, you know, people on the message boards are saying they relieved Shannon Dawson of his play calling at that point. And then the offense was great after that. I don't know if that's true. You know, I don't think even Houston, people that cover Houston would know if that's true because that's not stuff they tell you. But there's no doubt about it. That early in the year, I found the article, I sent it to Gary, so he knows it's true. Early in last season, fans were complaining about a, a very boring offense where they would never run anything interesting. And it was just run, run, run. And they were talking about how they were there was a game where it was really close with Tulane. And nine of the 12, first 12 plays in the second half were run plays in a really close game. And, you know, why are you doing that? It's so stupid. You know, and the reason I mention it is because it's the same thing Miami fans are talking about. It's the same exact stuff. So people want to blame Tyler. You know, I'm not saying blame Shannon Dawson, but I'm saying it could be a combination of factors. Like when it's when it's this many interceptions. And by the way, that year in Kentucky, where Shannon Dawson got fired after the year, where they parted ways, that quarterback that quarterback room threw 16 interceptions that year, and we've got 13 on the book so far this year. So like, there's a, a slight pattern of the last seven years of Shannon Dawson as coordinator, where a quarterback had major interception problems one year, and where the offense was super boring and just ran the ball a lot. You know. And, and sort of that was the bread and butter. So like, those are the facts of what I found from my horrible research. Uh, so look, you know, I don't know if Shannon Dawson is gonna unveil a whole new offense this week because there's so many things that we don't see. You know, the tight ends and the running backs are not part of the passing offense. There's no stretch to the run game at all. Even with Prashard Smith, uh, I don't understand how you at least aren't having him run, you know, maybe run some, maybe run some, something besides up the middle, you know, he's had a couple, I guess, um, but of end arounds really, but that's about it. Uh, but there has to be a way to stretch the field more than what Miami is doing. And, you know, I don't want to keep talking about it. I've been talking for way too long. And thank you for not interrupting Gary. I was actually testing you. This, this is all just nonsense. I, I, I just want to make sure I, I, I can't can't get interrupt me. I was just trying to get you to interrupt me and it didn't work. So I failed. I'm a big I failure, just like Miami. I've been smacked into shape in that regard, so I'm trying to behave myself. Um, look, if, if if I'm Shannon Dawson right now, and I'm seeing what Lance Guidry's done for this program this year, uh, I'm feeling like I need to pick it up, okay? And, and it's been really convenient and easy for everybody to blame Tyler Van Dyke, and Tyler Van Dyke has certainly taken that blame, and uh, we have a really good story with Tyler Van Dyke on the website right now. Um, he spoke to us yesterday and he really was as raw and loose as you'll ever see Tyler. And uh, he has really worked hard at just trying to get his head straight. You know, uh, I don't know if it was his idea or somebody else's idea, but he went back and watched film of himself in the big games that he's played just to remind himself, like, this is what I am capable of being. I, and, and he was damn good the last half of 2021. I don't care what anybody says. And maybe Rhett Lashley had a lot to do with it. Rhett Lashley is having success right now at SMU. He's proving himself as a pretty darn good coach. And uh, maybe Rhett Lashley had a lot to do with what Tyler Van Dyke did in 2021. But, you know, my question then would become if Rhett Lashley was responsible for what Tyler Van Dyke did in 2021, 
why in 2023 would Shannon Dawson not be incorporating some of those concepts and and taking advantage of that? Uh, I mean, look, I think Tyler has been. I mean, there, there's there's way more to Tyler just throwing interceptions than meets the eye. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell you we've done this deep investigation into every single play that's gone wrong or anything like that. We haven't, but they have. And um, and and if there is more to it, they should know that by now. And I don't know if they'll be able to get it straightened out for these last three games. I don't know if Tyler will ever play for the Miami Hurricanes again after the bowl game this year. Uh, there's so many unknowns, but uh, I do know this. Miami needs to win this game on Saturday, man. I mean, when you're sitting there looking looking at at being two and four in in the ACC uh, with the two wins being overtime games that you could have easily lost also, like um, this team is way better than this. I'm sorry. like this is these these kids have worked their butts off. They have, there's been a lot of player development this year, a lot of improvement. The defense is playing lights out. There is no reason for these games to all be close the way they've been, for them to be coming down to late in the fourth quarter where one play can shape them in either direction, kind of like what we saw up at NC State. Uh, there's just no reason for this, and, and uh, they've got to elevate themselves here these last couple games to leave this season – with the kind of positive feeling that maybe the work they've put in over the last 11 months deserves. Okay. You get blown out by Louisville. Don't play well Saturday at home against Louisville. Another opportunity on national TV against a rake team. I don't know, Matt. I don't know. I don't know what, what there would be to say, you know, if that's how this plays out. Well, I'll tell you, people do believe in this team because Bet MGM now has Miami as a one point favorite. Last I looked, so yeah, games can pick them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them are plus one, minus one. Uh, so, and this is against the number nine ranked team in the country, yeah. which tells probably you a little overrated. Probably a little overrated. Well, that's what people are basically. Yeah, people are yeah. saying that. Uh, obviously, yeah, they probably are. Nine. They're probably not really the ninth best team in the country, but yeah. And guess what? If, if Miami had won a couple of close games, you know they wouldn't be whatever they're ranked. But Correct. but the point is you want to win those games, you know, winning is the ultimate saving grace. And, you know, you, you have your column this morning, but I, I you know, I, I'll keep saying it, you know, as, as negative a person as I am in my actual real life, um, you know, I'm, I'm very positive about Miami's future. You know, I, again, I'll say it again. I think 10 wins next year, playoffs the following year, you know, nine, certainly nine plus wins next year. And then playoffs the following year. I don't think they're gonna be ready for the playoffs next year. Uh, you know, the, the transfer portal opens soon. That's going to be really important to get free agents. They've been stacking, you know, the, the, the recruiting they've been doing, I like, and I think they're on the right track, but the, the transfer portal, the way, the way they've dealt with it is just, it's, it's honestly, to me, it's abysmal. I don't like that. They're just bringing in guys desperate. They're just desperate for depth to compete, you know? Oh, well we have, you know, Wesley Bassaint, but we need somebody who's, you know, similar to him, uh, that can compete with him to start. Instead of getting a free agent, like if you want to get someone to compete with Wesley Bassaints, get a top recruit or something, or just let Wesley Bassaints be your starter. You know, I don't understand why you stack the roster with, you know, four or five guys that you already have that are older. You know, you need to balance your classes. You have top talent in all those classes across the board after four years of recruiting. And Mario's muddied the waters with the transfer portal, unfortunately. So I'm hoping this year they, you know, I don't think Mario will have to freak out. Like he clearly said after the, after the Florida State game that when he took over, the roster wasn't good enough. So he, he he freaked out. I get it. He wanted to win games. He took a million portal guys, whatever it was, 30 guys in two years. And um, and I get it, I guess, in a sense. But I would rather, you know, if you take all the portal guys and you go five and seven and whatever they're going to be this year, nothing fantastic. Like, you've just taken up a lot of spots with the Logan Sagapolus and John Dennis's and, you know, Devontae Browns. And, you know, you can go on and on and on. Like, not that those guys are awful, but, like, they're not difference makers. And if you're going to go in the portal, if you go in the portal, you need difference makers. Florida State's proven that. Other programs that have been winning with portal guys have proven that. There's no point taking the bad portal guys. Like, just leave them be. I'd rather have 10 open roster spots for the following year. So hopefully Mario's figured that out. And the good news is I don't think he's going to freak out as much this year in the portal because they need one quarterback. I don't think they need a running back. They may need one offensive lineman, depending um, on who, who ends up leaving. Uh, so that's two guys. 
I don't know if they will take a tight end. I think they're happy with Riley Williams and Elijah Roy will be back. I don't think they need a tight end unless there's a really top tight end in, in the portal, but it's hard to find those guys, period, let alone in the portal. So I don't think you take a tight end. So I think you need two guys and, and a receiver. If you have a top, top, top receiver, great, but I'm not sure they'll be able to get one at this point. And um, yeah. hopefully they, I mean, they got Elijah Lofton coming in and recruiting. Right, I was going to say they have a lot of recruits coming in that are going to yeah. be good receivers. So two offensive guys is all you really need as free agents. Okay. To me in the portal, two guys in offense, then on defense, their whole defensive line, you can disagree later. Their whole defense line is going to be amazing. I think they'll have the best defensive line in the country next year with, with Messador, Bain, Leonard Taylor. I don't think he can leave. Okay. Uh, so they're going to have a really good defensive line. I think Josh Horton's going to be a great defensive tackle. If you want to take a defensive tackle on the portal, I'm fine with that. But they already took they already took one, and if that Alabama kid doesn't wind up working out, then why'd you take him, right? So my guess is they're not going to take a, a defensive lineman in the portal. They don't need it unless they just wasted a spot on this Alabama guy for no reason. Uh, linebacker, you got you know you got plenty of talent there. You got four freshmen who should be ready by next year to help contribute, and you got guys coming back. Uh, so you don't need a linebacker. What you and, and what you need is defensive backs. I think they need four defensive backs. I think they need a whole new starting secondary. I think Cam Kinchins, James Williams leave. Uh, you know, maybe Cam comes back because at this point he's had a pretty rough season. I'm not sure that he'd be a high NFL pick. So maybe he comes back. So maybe three guys. But now you're talking five to six portal guys. That's all you need. Five to six free agents. I'm begging Mario now because I know he watches every morning and throws stuff at me uh, on his computer screen. I'm begging Mario, do not take average guys in the portal just to provide depth. I don't want depth in the portal. You keep doing it. Stop doing it. Build depth with recruiting. Take free agents and be done with it because the program now is where you can do that. You, you're, you've got enough talent with these first two recruiting classes. Like, let it be. And that's the way you're going to be great two years from now. So as long as he follows the match at all formula, we're going to be amazing. What? Are you wearing a gator shirt again? Jesus. It's a crocodile. What don't you understand? Don't you see the pointed snout? Look at the pointed snout. Don't you even know what a crocodile looks like? You don't even know the difference between an alligator and a crocodile? It's embarrassing, Furman. You're an embarrassment. All right. So we got the we got uh, my column looking at the big picture. We've got a uh, story with Tyler Van Dyke that's on, still on the website today if you haven't seen that. Uh, we have an analysis of the game on Saturday with Miami set to face a physical uh, Louisville team. Uh, we spoke to Damari Brown. He's one of six true freshmen that have started against Florida State. Uh, he he talks a little bit about that experience. Uh, we have a story with Matt Lee uh, where he talks a little bit about uh, just his experiences this year and Tyler Van Dyke. So all those things to to continue helping you guys get ready for, for the game Saturday are on the website today. Uh, I'm going to tell a little bit about some of the recruiting stuff here in a moment. But first, let me take a minute and talk about uh, Canesware. Canesware is simply uh, the largest Miami Hurricane store ever created. Tons of stuff, everything you could possibly want or need, you could find at Canesware. Uh, take a look real quick at the new Canesware. Welcome, Welcome to Canesware. New store, new items, same great experience. Family owned and operated since 2010, Canesware has the latest merchandise from the Miami Hurricanes, Miami Dolphins, Florida Panthers, Inner Miami CF, and more. Come visit us at our store in Davie on University Drive, just south of 595, or online at canesware.com. Canesware, the spot Miami fan shop. All right, so T-shirts, polos, hoodies, hats, flags, magnets, decals, anything you could possibly want they have at Canesware at 2655 South University Drive in Davie, canesware.com on the internet. Uh, they have all sizes for men, women, kids, babies. They will even dress your pet if you would like. And uh, if you want some dolphin gear, dolphin season's heating up now, getting towards the playoff run. Maybe you want a dolphin shirt or hat. You can get that at Canesware. Panthers kick it in. Great start coming off their Stanley Cup season. You can get Panther stuff at Canesware. Uh, Inner Miami, of course, is the hottest team in, in, in the world almost because of Messi. Um, you can get your Inter Miami stuff at Canesware as well. So go to 2655 South University Drive in Davie or canesware.com. Uh, check them out. You will not be sorry. Canesware is your headquarters for all your Miami Hurricanes merchandise needs. All right, Matt, let's turn our attention to recruiting where Miami got a commit 
on Wednesday night from uh, this one came out of nowhere, man. Um, a young man uh, by the name of Cole McConathy. He's from Spanish Fort, Alabama. He's a three-star defensive lineman who has been committed to Louisville, who made a secret visit to Miami a few weeks ago and now emerges as the latest commit in this class. He is an edge. You know, maybe he ends up playing linebacker. You know, we'll have to see. Maybe he ends does end up on the defensive line. But he's 6'5", 225 pounds. Um, they say he's got, you know, strong hands, good length, and he's he's quick. He can beat offensive tackles off the edge. So, obviously, Lance Guidry and the coaches saw something that they really liked about this kid. But um, but we've got uh, complete coverage on the website. We've got a story about his commitment, and we have a complete analysis uh, on him. So check out um, Miami's newest commit, Cole McConathy. We've got our usual assortment of recruiting coverage on the website, beginning with an analysis that with signing day around the corner, um, we give you an inside look at where things stand with every Miami Hurricanes offensive commitment. Uh, tomorrow we'll do the defense. Um but uh, you, I think you'll enjoy catching up on all the committed kids. Um, Miami is has offered uh, 2027 athlete Amari Irvin. Um, he's got some local ties. He's visited for a game earlier this season. Check up on what uh, Amari Irvin is saying. Um, Chance Robinson. Chance Robinson's the talk of recruiting right now because of his flirtations um, with Ohio State. And Ole Miss, uh, we think it's a Miami Ohio State battle. So we, so Stephen Wagner went and got with Ohio State's recruiting writer, and they together broke down what they think that Chance Robinson's recruitment is going to look like here in the final month of recruiting as we count down to signing day, the early signing day on the twentieth of December. Uh, you'll want to be sure to check that out. Um, we also have a um, a couple other. Uh, stories on um, a three-star linebacker com uh, that Miami's recruiting and um, another, actually a couple commits that are getting offers from other programs. So make sure you check that out along with our weekly uh, tracking the Miami Hurricanes. Uh, that's that's where we uh, give you a statistical look and in some cases a video look on what the commits are doing in their high school games each week with the playoffs now getting into full swing. So make sure you check that out as well. If you missed the Lamar Thomas show last night, uh, you can catch that as well on the website this morning. So the countdown continues to Miami versus Louisville Saturday at noon at Hard Rock Stadium. Um, like I said, a game that to me, like, come on, man, like enough already. Miami, Miami has, has this is a chance to put a real, a much happier face on the season as a whole. Um, then if you can go beat BC the day after Thanksgiving, now you're eight and four, knowing that you really were nine and three with the Georgia Tech fiasco. And while you don't like the way you've lost those other games, uh, at least you unequivocally, without anybody arguing with you, can say we took a step forward this season. It wasn't as great as maybe it could have been, but we have a building block for 2024. Uh, so this game Saturday, and I, you know, I've been saying they're all important. They have all been important and um, have not gone the way we'd like would like them to. This one is very important because of the way these other games have gone. There's a difference between going seven and five or six and six into the bowl games, um, then fin finishing your year strong, winning eight and four. Then you can go win a bowl game, and now you really do have true momentum going into uh, the next season. So that's going to do it for today for Good Morning Cane Sport. We thank you so much for starting out your day with us. If you're on YouTube right now, hit your subscribe and like buttons. It does help us with the algorithms at YouTube in growing our audience. If you are not yet a subscriber to canesport.com, please, please, please come join our community of fans. Uh, we got a great, great fan community. Uh, they go at each other sometimes now. It gets a little bit animated and uh, a little ugly at times on the message boards, particularly when things aren't going well. Uh, but that's also part of the fun. And uh, so come join our community of fans and let us do what we do every single day to make your fan experience as good as it can be. So for Matt Shodell, who I must confess has behaved pretty well today, 
I'm Gary Furman. We thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you again tomorrow, everybody. Have a great day.